Um, I am Kata Berlin, um, faculty director of Latin American, Caribbean and Iberian Studies program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, called, in brief, LASIS. LASIS, our program, in uh, collaboration with uh, the Center for Latin American and uh, Caribbean Studies of the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, uh, has uh, have prepared together and uh, have the pleasure to inaugurate today a migration webinar series. Um, we planned this migration webinar series to be an in-person conference uh, that's going to take place in April of 2019. We had everything prepared. Uh, our panelists had their tickets purchased and hotels booked. And as everybody knows, we had to cancel uh, everything that was happening in April due to the spread of the pandemic. So we are meeting today virtually. And I would like to uh, give a special welcome to all of you who are coming, joining us from outside of medicine. And I want to assure you that you're really not missing much today because this is the worst weather that we've had for many, many, many months. It's cold and raining and we would probably anyway be stuck inside. Um, so to begin, I would like to say thank you to our organizational committee um, and on the side of UW Medicine Lassis, this committee consisted of Janelle Anderson, Erin Barbato, Leslie Bartlett, Laura Boone, Armando Ibarra, Caroline Callenborn, Michael Light, Jenna Lloyd, Benjamin Marquez, Sarah McKinnon, and Jenna Nobles. I would like to say thank you to the CLAX team from Milwaukee, especially to Julie Klein and Natasha Borges Suhiyama. I would like to say thank you to our LASIS team, especially Alberta Vargas, our associate director, Sarah Reed, and um, recently, uh, joining us M, who had made this meeting possible. And I would like to say thank you to IRIS, Institute for Regional and International Studies, especially to Leslie Bartland and Andrew uh, Rikhingsani, who are co-sponsoring uh, this migration webinar series. Um, as you know, Millions of people every year are forced out from their homes and they move through borders, cross oceans and deserts in search of new homes. These searches are called migrations and have been politicized by the states and institutions of the globalized world. They are turned to objects of regulations, negotiations, while people struggle in the growingly challenging environment and I think this environment has ever been that challenging uh, as it has been during the last six months in the time of the COVID. The purpose of our migration webinar is to tell stories, reflect, and also make suggestions of how to help all these people in search of a place to live. We do this by bringing to our webinar series authors of cutting edge research on migration as those that we have with us today as well as activists and migrants themselves later on our later panels will be focused on central america september 23rd crossing u.s borders september 30th providing legal services to women and children october 7th trends in immigration reform October 14th, transnational migration, especially Venezuela, October 21st, South South migration, October 28th, Afro Latin America, American migration stories, November 4th, immigration from Latin America to the Midwest, 
November 11, and something Milwaukee ties. Um, today's panel is focused on gender, sexuality, and migration in the Americas. And it has been prepared and is going to be moderated by Jenna Lloyd, um, who is here with us. Jenna is an associate professor of geography at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Her work focuses on health, politics, and carceral and abolition geographies, as well as politics of asylum, refugee resettlement, and deterrence in the US policy. Um, Jenna is the author of three books, Health Rights are Civil Rights, uh, published in 2014, um, Beyond Walls and Cages, Prison Borders and Global Crisis, 2012, and co-author of Boats, Borders and Bases, Race and the Cold War, and the Rise of Migration Detention in the United States. Um, without further ado, I will pass it to Jenna, who will introduce our today's panelists and start our discussion. Thank you so much for preparing this panel and for joining us today. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Kata, and to the organizing committees in both Madison and in Milwaukee. Um, it's wonderful that we've been able to join together um, and share the work that we've done across this whole semester and that we can invite people from um, outside of our two cities um, to come join us virtually. Um, so what I am going to do is briefly introduce our three speakers um, and then I will give you um, as audience members a sense about our plan for, um, for today. So um, I think we might go in alphabetical order because we did not establish an order. Um, so I will start with Sandy Bell. Um, Dr. Sandy Bell Borges is Assistant Professor in Women's and Gender Studies at Loyola Mar Marymount University in California. She received her PhD in Feminist Studies from UC Santa Barbara and was faculty in Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies program at UW Eau Claire. She was also a postdoctoral fellow in the Center for Mexican American Studies at UT Austin. Her work investigates how heteronormativity, white supremacy, and exploitation are naturalized and institutionalized within migration processes and their impact on Latinx LGBTQ migrants in Los Angeles and Mexico City. Her work has uh, been published in Women's Studies Quarterly, the Journal of Lesbian Sp Studies, and uh, Chicano Latino Studies. Chicana Latina Studies, my apologies. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Etna Lubaid, who is Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at University of Arizona. She um, has also been uh, served as the director of the Institute for LGBT Studies at University of Arizona. She earned her PhD in Ethnic Studies from UC Berkeley, and her research focuses on the connections among queer lives, state immigration controls, and justice struggles. She's the author of Entry Denied, Controlling Sexuality at the Border, and Pregnant on Arrival, Making the Illegal Immigrant. Her current book manuscript, Why Don't They Just Get in Line, uh, which is a quotation, um, Immigration, Deportability, and Queer Intimacies, explores how deportability is being extended and resisted through intimate ties between undocumented migrants and US citizens. Um, she is also co-editing the second volume of Queer Migrations, or Queer Migrations 2, I should say, uh, with Karma Chavez, whom many of you will know from uh, Madison. Um, so Queer Migrations 2, the subtitle being Illegalization, detention and deportation. Um, and she was the uh, editor of the special issue of Journal and Lesbian Studies um, that featured um, Sandy Bell's, one of Sandy Bell's articles. Finally, uh, uh, Dr. Dario Valles is an ACLS Emerging Voices Fellow at Columbia University 
in the Department of Anthropology and Institute, on Research, Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality. Prior to this, he was a postdoctoral research associate in race and ethnicity at Brown University. He completed his PhD in anthropology at Northwestern University. Um, Dr. Velez's work centers on anthropological uh, and interdisciplinary analyses of welfare infrastructures, race, gender, intimate labor, children and youth, social movements, and Latin American immigration and diaspora. His work has been published in the Journal of Latin American Geography and with UCLA's Institute for Research on Labor and Employment. So as you can see, we have uh, uh, a great panel, an interdisciplinary panel of um, scholars here to talk about uh, gender and sexuality um, from their research. Um, so their presentations will last somewhere in the realm of 15 minutes, and then um, we will have time for some question and answer. Um, I'm going to ask that we hold questions until the end, and we'll take those questions within, um, within the chat, and I can re-explain that. So if you have questions as um, presenters are presenting, um, I can take note of those, um, but we're going to, um, to hold them till, um, till the end. Um, with that, um, shall I turn it over to uh, Sonny Ball? Thank you everybody for, for being here. Okay, great. Um, hello everybody, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you uh, to Latin American and Caribbean, Caribbean and Iberian Studies at UW-Madison and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at UW-Milwaukee for inviting us to be a part of, of this panel. Um, thank you, Jenna, for moderating. Uh, so the, the title of my, of my paper, my presentation today is Journeys of Belonging, Latina Migrant Lesbians Challenging Isolation. And this is part of a, a chapter that I am working on um, as part of my, of my book project. Here I discuss the ways in which a group of Latina migrant lesbians living in Long Beach, California, practiced community building in the context of structural and systemic oppression. I argue that the narrators used processes that are unique to their multidimensional locations as lesbians, migrants, and Latinas to create community through, despite, and against displacement, homophobia, and racism. To do this, I look at two spaces of, of, of belonging, and these are gay clubs and physical homes. I interviewed the, the narrators in fall of 2013 in Long Beach, California. At the time, the narrators were in their late 30s or early 40s, identified as lesbian and women, and were, they were friends. Their names and ages at the time of the interviews were Rocio, who was 40 years old, Claudia was 39, the Yamira was 37, Berenice was 39, and Victoria was 44. And all of these names, except for one, are pseudonyms that were chosen by the narrators themselves. Claudia is from Honduras, and the other four narrators are from Mexico. I position migrant lesbian belonging as refusal to the isolation created by systemic and intersecting violence. And when I say belonging, I do not mean belonging to the nation state, but to queer communities of color. In a context where anti-immigration policies, racism, exploitation, homophobia, and patriarchy oppress queer migrants, building a sense of belonging is a powerful act. It pushes back against the message that as migrants and or lesbians and racialized, they do not belong anywhere, and involves negotiating where they can safely be themselves. The topic of isolation came up in several of the narratives. Rocio, for example, described feeling a deep sense of loneliness in Mexico as she was coming to terms with her sexuality. Having witnessed homophobia, she feared for her safety. And because she knew no other lesbians, she thought that she was the only one. Claudia was familiar with this feeling um, 
of feeling like the only one. And like Rocio, struggled to explore her desire amid homophobia and gender conformity. Social pressure to conform resulted in fear, anxiety, and anger. From an early age, Claudia felt attraction toward other females. But um, but because she she liked dressing quote unquote like a like a boy, she recalled that other children would quote tease me and would call me marimacha or dyke, and I remember feeling so much anger end quote. Back then, Claudia was still living in Honduras with her father and siblings, which she did from age two when her mother first migrated to the U.S. in search for economic opportunities. At the age of 14, her mother petitioned for Claudia and her sister to reunite with, with her, with her mother in the US. Upon arrival in the US, Claudia was faced with adjusting to a new environment and culture while feeling alone and disconnected from her mother. Her sister, whom Claudia considered her best friend, married and move out, moved out within a few years. A new layer of isolation and marginalization as a migrant was placed on top of the isolation that came from feeling desire for other young women. And these are only two, two of the narratives, but the other, the other folks that I interviewed in Long Beach um, expressed a similar, um, similar feeling, a feeling like the only ones. So living within multiple systems of oppression was isolating for the narrators, leading them to think, again, that they were the only ones. The multiplicity and multidimensionality of their social locations, which operated within interlocking oppressive systems, made community building all the more necessary. I want to address gay clubs, which scholars have identified as the quintessential gay space, where the dance floor is what Jose Munoz describes as, quote, a stage for queer performativity that is integral to everyday life, end quote. As Eddie Alvarez has documented, queer migrants are among the, the, the clients um, of these queer um, or gay, gay clubs. The narrators that I interviewed in Long Beach named gay bars and clubs as spaces where they felt whole and seen and where they could meet other Latina lesbian migrants with whom to build community. For example, Rocio's introduction to these spaces was life changing. Short, shortly after moving to Long Beach, she became friends with a woman from her home city who was also a lesbian. Quote, she was the one who started taking me places, introducing me to people. And that's where I began to see that life was normal because I used to think that being a lesbian was like, I felt like coming out and accepting that I was a lesbian was like marginalizing myself within my family. When I met this friend who took me places here in Long Beach, well, I met two or three people who were lesbians and started feeling comfortable meeting women, talking about being lesbian and liking women, end quote. Meeting other Latina lesbians introduced Rocio to a world where being a lesbian was not associated with shame and where she could hold on to her Latina roots. The first time that she went to a gay bar or, or a gay club, and she used these terms interchangeably, it was eye-opening. She said, Quote, and that's where my world opened up, end quote. Victoria, too, was clear that gay clubs were places where meaningful connections were created. Quote, the only places that I knew I could find other people like me was, was at the gay clubs, like the Executive Suite, El Que Será, because I live in Long Beach, and that was our point of reunion. Actually, I built my social circle from there. I haven't been there in a long time, and throughout the years, my social circle expanded and the points of reunion weren't the clubs anymore. It was somebody's house, a barbecue. That's how I found a community." End quote. <clears throat> Victoria found a home in these spaces and formed what Juana Maria Rodriguez describes as, quote, community and familia through music and dance, end quote. Gay clubs hold deep significance for queer racialized Latinx like Victoria, for whom, as Jose Munoz beautifully articulates, quote, it matters to get lost in queer dance or to use dance to get lost, lost from the evidentiary logic of heterosexuality, end quote. Mm -hmm. at, these quo at these clubs, the narrators found the potential to become queer familia. Nevertheless, these sites of belonging were of course not free 
of complexity. Victoria explained, quote, if you look Latina and you have an accent, you don't belong. Even if you, even if they look Latina, but they don't speak Spanish, you don't mingle with them. Yeah, it was like that. But again, there's a lot of different groups like white girls. We used to call them white girls, Caucasians, who mingle with everybody. I also noticed that most of my friends at the time, they wanted to keep themselves separate from, from men, from gay men. I never liked these divisions, end quote. Gay clubs were certainly not perfect, and belonging and safety are most definitely not clear-cut. Victoria voiced the often dichotomous tensions within Latinx spaces, in this case, migrants vis-a-vis -vis US born and lesbian and gay spaces, in this case, women vis-a-vis -vis men. These tensions, tensions are not surprising because internal disagreements and conflicts often occur within communities where marginalized individuals find refuge. And this happens because, as Sarah Ahmed and Anna Marie Fortier have pointed out, quote, communities are affected by relations of power in the very way in which they involve some bodies and not others, end quote. So linguistic markers, like having an accent or not speaking English or Spanish, determined who belonged where at these, at these clubs. This phenomenon cautions us against romanticizing the concept of community as though it were, it were free of conflict, power dynamics, or divisions. And while it is undeniably necessary to recognize these conflicts, they did not diminish their significance for, for the narrators. Berenice, one of the other narrators, enjoyed going to gay clubs, but she had to be very careful about where she went. She said, quote, I didn't have the luxury of going to the bars, but we did go every once in a while, end quote. Berenice was married to a man for 20 years, time during which she was also in relationships with women and never disclosed her sexuality to her family. Fearing that someone would recognize her at these clubs, she preferred social gatherings at friends' homes. Home plays an important role in the lives of migrants and of queer migrants in particular. Migrants often recreate a sense of home by holding on to their traditions, cultures, and values. But in doing so, as scholars have pointed out, they sometimes uh, reproduce heteropatriarchy and nationalism, rendering women and queers invisible. For that reason, queer migrants often create their own homes, which is part of their strategy for surviving violence as queer, racialized migrants. And so the physical home became a space where the narrators created an emotional home that fostered belonging. Their physical home was, the physical home was a place to gather and strengthen their connections to one another. The connection between home as a physical and an emotional space was clear at a Dia de los Muertos celebration hosted by Rocio and Teyamira. Dia de los Muertos is a Mexican tradition that takes place on November 1st and 2nd and honors those who have passed. People set up an altar or an ofrenda in their homes to offer food, drinks, sweets, and flowers to the spirits of loved ones who are no longer physically present. The five narrators and their friends gathered to enjoy food, drinks, music, laughter, and conversation. When I arrived, their ofrenda was already set up taking up most of the wall adjacent to the kitchen. And it had food, skulls, candles, and photos of loved ones. Spanish music was playing in the background. The Yamira and Rocio served homemade Mexican food and Mexican beer from Baja California. And their home had colorful Mexican decorations. Some of the conversations that evening revolved around coming out or not, migration stories, and lesbian jokes. With this celebration, Rocio and the Yamira embraced their Mexican heritage while, ma while making their physical home a lesbian space for themselves and their friends. They, they used decorations, food, music, and spiritual objects, beliefs, and practices to make their home home, a space where they could feel welcome. Such gatherings nurtured friendly and sometimes romantic relationships. For example, the Yamira recalled meeting Rocio's friends shortly after meeting Rocio at one of these gatherings. She said, quote, that night we were with our friends. I was like, oh my God, I'm home. 
all lesbian women. Some had partners, some were single, but for the first time, I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to be anything. I was just there. I was home. And it branches out because she knows her and she knows somebody else. So there are people that I still don't know. But the community just keeps getting bigger." End quote. The Yamira used the, the word home to describe being in community with other Latina lesbians. Her feeling at home while at a friend's home disrupted the isolation that she had felt. The Yamira's words capture the way that being part of a community affirmed her. So the narrators build what Giancarlo Cornejo calls queer friendship, which has the power to, quote, create affective spaces that heal wounds inflicted by social norms, end quote. The narrators created, maintained, and nourished these friendships, these relationships, which also brought material benefits as they often shared information and resources with one another. Adi Kunzman argues that belonging, and I quote, is constituted through and not against violence, end quote. While I agree with this, with this statement, I also propose that, that a sense of belonging also has the potential to challenge the products of violence. With the exception of Victoria, who was starting to become involved in politicized spaces, the rest of the narrators did not engage in activism or move in activist spaces. Nevertheless, these narratives demonstrate that a sense of belonging confers far more than comfort. Finding, building, maintaining, and nourishing a sense of belonging allowed the narrators both to live through and to challenge isolation, rejection, displacement, invisibility, all created by systems of oppression. In the face of, of oppression, the narrators' processes of, com of community building were unique to their multidimensional locations. And the, these spaces of belonging that they created humanized and affirmed their existence. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, it is it is odd to not hear <laughs> clapping afterwards. Um, uh, Edna, turn it to you. Okay. So again, we're, for people in the audience, we're going to hold questions until the end. I see a, a, a thing of myself that's about one inch square, so I don't know what you're seeing, but we're going to just work with this technology. So I want to say thank you, Sandevel. I'm so happy to follow and continue this conversation. Um, I want to thank the organizers. Um, organizing in this kind of context is additionally challenging, and I just appreciate so much that you would have made these conversations possible. Thanks a lot. And I also want to thank the audience. Um, I'm going to read to you, and here's what I'm going to read to you about. I've read so many accounts of people, including LGBTQ folks, who end up detained and deported as a result of a traffic stop, that that has become a chapter in my current book, and it's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm also going to talk about it because I absolutely hate driving, and I learned extremely late. So I've just been tracking driving as a way to think through a whole lot of things. Attention to traffic enforcement gives us a lens through which we can see how infrastructures of enforcement are entangled with gendered and sexualized relations of power that articulate racial, neo-colonial, settler, and capitalist inequalities, which is what I believe Jenna asked us to address in the earliest iteration of this panel before the pandemic. Um, so I, that's what I'm planning to address. But in addition, I wanted to talk about traffic enforcement because it helps us to understand how logics of detention and deportation are embedded in aspects, all aspects of everyday life. And I really want to think about what does that mean and what like both challenges and opportunities perhaps does that offer. Now, lots has been written about traffic enforcement and migrant deportation, but nothing that centers LGBTQ migrants. So one of my challenges was how can I even write a chapter when there's no written information that I can use and how do I pull it together? 
Now, the gap reflects a more general problem, which is that also the scholarship on deportation has grown tremendously. There's still very little attention to deportation as gendered and gendering, or as implicated in heterosexist and transphobic orders that articulate other modes of power. And I do want to shout out to the panelists and Jenna, who are folks who are really challenging those gaps in scholarship. I want to be, so for today, here's where I'm going to go with this. I'm going to situate deportation in historical context. I'm going to highlight it involves not just material and legal infrastructure, but also affect, and that the two are interconnected through the state's promotion of attrition. As folks probably know, attrition is a strategy of deliberately making everyday life so miserable and impossible and people so fearful that migrants feel compelled to leave. And already I feel I'm speaking so much in conversation with what Sandoval has put out there that this is really very nice order. I'll also talk about the Andakibas project, which involved LGBTQ migrants and others who rode a bus to the Democratic National Convention. The bus had the word sin sin miedo written in giant letters on the side. <clears throat> and I argue they circulated a counter affective economy of being undocumented and unafraid that refused the dominant demand for migrants to live in fear and demanded abolition of logics and practices of attrition and deportation. My work frames deportation in this way. I see it as inseparable from and a means to reproduce the dynamics of global apartheid that uproot and scatter people, landing them in situations where their labor is wanted and exploited, but they have no route to legal status, security, or rights. I also try to make clear that deportation is not a one-time unfortunate, exceptional, or deserved experience, which are kind of the dominant stories, but rather deportation logics and practices are forms of violence. They are integral to migration control. They underpin normative citizenship, and there's quite a bit of scholarship that says we would not have citizenship without deportation, which raises lots of things to talk about. The deportation logics are increasingly interwoven into the everyday fabric of our lives, and they shape all our interactions, even when we don't notice it. I theorize deportation is connected to attrition, and many of you know that that began as a right-wing policy that is now mainstream. And it deliberately sets out to make all aspects of everyday life so miserable, so unbearable, and so impossible that migrants will voluntarily leave or decide to not come. Or at least that's the story. Now we know that has not, in fact, since it doesn't address why folks are migrating, in fact, attrition policies have not appreciably changed migration flows. But it is a recipe for licensed cruelty and violence, including fostering fear and terror. Just to give a rough sense of the scale, and this is disputed, since the 1990s, some 5 million people, roughly, have been forcibly deported from the United States, and millions more are at constant risk of being deported. This is a horrific and heartbreaking number, and we know the effects are felt not just by deported people, but entire families, communities, neighborhoods, regions that are self-contained and also span borders. The practical mechanics of U.S. deportation build on the histories of the forced expulsion of Native peoples, poor peoples, and political dissidents, on fugitive slave laws and the black codes, and on Japanese internment. The deportation of migrants specifically also required the state to develop infrastructure for that purpose, which it has been doing since the late 19th century. And scholars like Nyan Shaw and May Nye suggest that in the first half of the 20th century, the state's growing capacity to undertake deportation helped to consolidate whiteness, binary gender, heterosexuality channeled into middle-class marriage, and private property ownership as national norms of citizenship. Under today's attrition regimes, deportation logics have become embedded into all kinds of everyday activities. 
The fact traffic enforcement is now a major pipeline to deportation illustrates a kind of larger trend that I think we're all living with. At a practical level, turning everyday activities into, quote, opportunities to generate deportation is possible because local law enforcement officials are increasingly authorized to perform immigration enforcement functions, even though these are supposedly a federal responsibility. The meshing of federal migration control with state and local law enforcement is terrifying because it multiplies the ways that people end up being targeted based on their actual or presumed legal status and on the racist, anti-poor, transphobic and homophobic practices that are endemic to policing, about which there's a very significant literature, so I'm not going to discuss that right at this moment. We also know that for any migrants, and including LGBTQ migrants, any and all contacts with police may contribute to the risk of deportation. And this is not because folks have done anything wrong, but because of the contact itself and how that is viewed within the larger system. So within this general picture of policing, I was curious, so what do we know about interactions involving traffic enforcement and how they lead to deportation? There's quite a bit of literature about how the police profile stop and criminalize African-American and Latinx, Latinx drivers at disproportionately high rates. We know much less about how gender, sexuality, and immigration status inequalities get reproduced in the process. Andrea Ritchie's book, Invisible No More, highlights that experiences of black, indigenous, and other women of color, immigrant, and queer folk tend to be ignored in studies and public discussions of unjust traffic stops. And she does pull together data that shows how racialized traffic stops are thoroughly gendered and gendering in ways that reproduce other inequalities. And I really appreciate that book. It helps us to begin to think through these questions. But I'm not able to take it further because we simply don't have that kind of data. Um, there's a whole lot of gaps about LGBTQ migrants and deportation and about how traffic stops might fit into that. Now, links of attrition and infrastructures of enforcement are not just about laws, institutions, and practices like traffic stops, but also about affect. Exploring traffic enforcement as a pipeline to deportation helps us to understand how these affective logics work. Sarah Ahmed's work offers a starting place to think about this. As we know, Ahmed challenges the idea that emotions reside in and originate from sovereign individuals. And instead, she argues emotions function like an economy, sliding between figures and signs and sticking to certain figures around which intense feelings accumulate. Building on Ahmed, Margo, Margaret France has argued that the love and fear are the affective pivot points for contemporary immigration politics. Building on France, I would say the politics of attrition, detention, and deportation are central to that affective economy, including by positioning migrants, and especially undocumented migrants, as fearful others toward whom violent and lawless policies are justified. The flip side of the citizen who is supposed to live in fear of the migrant other is the expectation that migrants will live in fear, especially if they're undocumented. And immigration enforcement deliberately seeks to intensify those feelings of fear. Thomas Holman was Trump's first acting director of ICE, though he actually also worked for um, the Obama administration. And he said very explicitly, quote, undocumented immigrants should be afraid. News organizations asked him to explain further, and he said this. He says, if you lie on your taxes, you've got to be worried. Is the IRS going to audit me? When you speed down the highway, you've got to worry. Am I going to get a speeding ticket? You worry. It's natural human behavior, close quote. That's him. Basically, I read his argument as saying that undocumented immigrants should live in fear because they have engaged in individual wrongdoing. And that is a widely shared perspective. 
That perspective ignores the extraordinary scholarship and activism that understands that when people are undocumented and deportable, this is not an issue of, quote, bad individuals who, quote, made bad decisions, but rather it's an outcome of neo-colonial histories and transnational dynamics of inequality that on one hand generate migration, but then offer no route to legal status, security, or rights. And folks like Holman believe if undocumented people do not live in fear, they must lack the capacity for moral judgment. And this is a racist colonialist argument that shows up actually in lots of public discourse that we can talk about later if people would like to. So a central part of the politics of attrition and enforcement involves making sure migrants live in fear with the intention of exhausting and wearing down people. And there can be no doubt that turning everyday activities like driving into occasions when you may be deported does cause people to experience fear, stress, and worry that wears down bodies and spirits in many ways. There's a 2014 video by Latinx queers, many of whom are migrants, who describe some of what it's like to try to drive when you're ineligible for a driver's license. One of the interviewees, Nadia, describes that whenever she has to drive to work, her wife and kids worry, quote, if I'm going to be okay, if I will get stopped by the police. Since she doesn't have a driver's license and she is undocumented, she worries too, quote, I don't know when will be the last day that I will see them. Now, Amalia Payares and Ruth Gomberg Munoz describe that in this context of profound repression and state violence, a small but committed group of activists have responded to intensified policing by becoming more visible, not less. And some of that visibility has been organized through the framework of undocumented and unafraid. That framework was significantly generated by young undocumented migrants of color, many of whom were LGBTQ identified. And the framework also drew on and repurposed queer histories of coming out by advocating for coming out as undocumented, which is kind of a complicated gesture that Karma Chavez's book really um, addresses. The framework was initially tied to dreamer activists that sought legal status for deserving young migrants. But over time, it shifted significantly to include a broader range of undocumented people and to reject the view of undocumented status as a marker of wrongdoing. Instead, activists reframed undocumented status as a collective condition that reflects the outcome of intersecting forms of power, domination, and inequality. And in that context, undocumented and unafraid cultivates feelings that are very different from the worry, fear, dehumanization, and hopelessness that are demanded by the US government. It offers a counter-affective economy that rejects the dominant cultural view of undocumented people, forges new forms of individual and collective subjectivity that are not first and foremost grounded in individualized experience of fear, and enable political actions designed to foster security and life for those who are most targeted by attrition and deportation. The Undocubus project really exemplified and in fact further circulated this because if you remember, affect circulates like an economy and the bus and its riders actually worked as an economy to circulate undocumented and unafraid in the public sphere. This involved folks who rode a refurbished bus called Priscilla from Phoenix, Arizona, the to the Democratic National Convention in Charlotte, North Carolina in 2012, and they made stops along the way. The side of the bus said, sin papeles, sin miedo, no papers, no fear, along with an image of a monarch butterfly. Like a rolling billboard, the bus and its riders displayed the concept of being undocumented and unafraid to everyone who encountered them along the journey. Given how heavily traffic stops are a means to identify and deport people, we know the riders face significant risk of being stopped, arrested, and deported. 
They included significant numbers of LGBTQ people and their logics and practices were also queer in the sense of being oriented toward making survival and livability possible for undocumented people in the face of unspeakable state repression. So to bring this together, what I've been trying to sketch out a little bit is that logics of attrition support the continual expansion of deportation into all aspects of our lives while demanding that migrants live in fear. The fact traffic stops have become a pipeline to deportation illustrates this. Fear in tandem with racist, heterosexist, neo-colonial enforcement practices that materially dispossess people and channel many into deportation is intended to wear down and wear out migrants' bodies and beings. In this context of extreme violence, queer activists and allies have carved out possibilities for survival and livability and sought to build and share a vision of possibilities for living otherwise, including through the counter-affective economy of undocumented and unafraid. In conclusion, the fact deportation and deportability has become interwoven into so many acts of everyday life is at once terrifying and perhaps offers opportunities for every single one of us to contribute toward working to abolish the entire system. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. Um, Dario. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. And I will take the, the question that came in um, and take a note on that for the um, end as Dario sets up slides. Okay, um, do you all see the slides? Are they coming up? No. No. Uh, okay, well. Yes. There oh, we there go. You go. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you, Jenna, and all the organizers for um, this wonderful invitation to participate um, on this panel with uh, such uh, distinguished panelists. Sanibal uh, Etne, um, and thank you, University of Madison and Milwaukee, um, and hello, all my friends uh, there. Um, I first wanted to recognize the scholar strike um, that is happening uh, today, um, and I present today with a specific attention to police violence and in the spirit of abolition. Um, and so um, I'd also like to say that this research is in, uh, I'm developing as part of an ongoing research project. Um, and it's now being developed remotely um, with local organizations on the ground in Tijuana. And I'd like to thank the support of the ACLS. Um, and I'm just very fortunate to be um, here uh, participating with you all. Okay, the next slide should, all right. There we go, it's a little delayed. Um, Julieta is a Honduran trans woman living in Mexico, uh, awaiting asylum, her asylum court hearing in the U.S. The first time Julieta and her partner Luis were attacked was outside the pharmacy Similares in Playas de Tijuana on May 13, 2019. Four men in a black car approached them and almost kidnapped them, but they were able to get away. As they ran away, the men started shooting at them. Julieta barely escaped with a head injury and being hit over the head with the handle of the gun. Her partner, Luis, shot in the leg but, but wasn't injured. Out of, the, out of the four men in the vehicle that approached them, she recalls that the man who hit her had the number 18, or 18, tattooed on his wrist, a known symbol of the Mara, 18. Um, and the 18, 18 references its origins as the 18th Street Gang founded in Los Angeles that is now based throughout Central America. In May, of, May 15, 2019, she and her partner filed a police report that, about this attempted kidnapping um, and were told that they can only file this report individually. On November 28, 2019, she and her partner were walking to the store in the Altamira neighborhood in Tijuana 
where a black car approached them in front of a Kali Max grocery store around 7 p.m. She recognized the black car as the same car that had tried to kidnap them on May 13th. She was able to identify the man with the 18 or the Esiocho tattoo right away. While she was able to escape by jumping in a nearby ditch, her partner was kidnapped by, by force and taken in the vehicle. Since then, she has begun to receive threats on her phone call on, on her phone from private numbers warning her not to file a police report. The voice messages on the phone state that if she goes to the police, they will murder her, her partner, Luis, Luis Alfonso. She received a phone call on December 3rd, 2019 from Luis Alfonso. This would be the last time she hears from him. He said he was being tortured in order to give up Julieta's whereabouts to the gang. Luis said he had refused to give up any information and told Julieta to escape because the Mara de Siocho were coming after her. Luis told me that the gang was going to kill someone in her family in, in Honduras. And on September 6, 2019, her cousin was shot in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. She filed a police report about the kidnapping of Luis on December 20th, 2019 in Tijuana. On January 5th, 2020, she was in her room at the Altamira uh, uh, apartment when five men broke in through the front door and forcibly entered. She was able to escape through a window after catching a glimpse of the five men with covered faces. She returned to her apartment the next day and was told by a neighbor that there was a man with a hat and a gun they kept, they was keeping watch around her apartment. Julieta's neighbor told her they would, it would be better if she did not return to the property. Julieta feared for her life and had no place to run in Mexico. She feared that the organized crime group responsible for murdering her family in Honduras, the transnational Diosiocho gang, had followed her to Mexico. In addition, she had filed a complaint with the National Human Rights Commission um, against the local Tijuana police officer who had extorted her and her partner on September 11, 2019. She is currently waiting for the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol to grant her parole in the U.S. So I met Julieta earlier this winter when I served as a volunteer translator for a local refugee and asylum-seeking aid organizations in Tijuana, Mexico was one of several tens of thousands of asylum seekers stranded in transit as a result of the U.S.'s migrant protection protocols. They're known as the Remain in Mexico policy. Since the Trump administration created the Migrant Protection Protocols, or MPP, in 2018, waves of migrant car caravans from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, alongside migrants from Haiti, West Africa, and the Arab world seeking entry into the U.S. have forced to remain in Mexico paying their asylum court hearings. Today we'll talk about the lived experiences of trans women from Central America as they linger in legal limbo and are exposed to dangers on, the, on Mexico's northernmost border city of Tijuana. The pro bono U.S.-based immigration attorney who took up Julieta's pending asylum case had decided to expedite a petition for immediate parole into the U.S. based on the horrific threats and kidnapping attempt in Mexico described earlier. Immigrant activists have decried the MPP policy as a deterrent policy meant to create an insurmountable bottleneck at the border of asylum applicants who, with few resources and legal rights, are exposed to predation, violence, exploitation, and even death at the hands of local law enforcement and transnational organized crime syndicates. Most recently, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol have has capitalized on the global COVID-19 pandemic to essentially grind the asylum legal system to a halt. There are currently 65,000 asylum seekers as of July 1st of this year, and of those, 1,200 reported cases of murder, rape, torture, kidnapping, and other violent assaults. Uh, this map is, is obviously dated. Um, the, the numbers have just um, been piling up that there's um, still a backlog in, in gathering the information and mapping it, but these are uh, essentially the major ports of entry where, um, and the numbers of asylum seekers at each port of entry um, on the Mexican side waiting to, to um, waiting while their cases are pending. Queer and transgender ge geographies provide valuable insights into the conditions under which some gender non-binary Central American asylum seekers encounter forms of everyday and lethal violence in Tijuana often circulated in media narratives as one of the world's most dangerous cities. 
I'm an anthropologist who has been research researching the variety of lived experiences of West African, Caribbean, and Central American migrants displaced in Baja, California, and especially interested in how Black and Indigenous waves of migration to the region are shifting local racial and gender formations within a settler colonial trans-Pacific context. Julieta and her family's violent encounters with organized crime reveal how Central American trans, trans women's spatial mobility and bodily safety in Tijuana are tied to the transatlantic immigration and border militarization. I draw from queer and Latin American and indigenous feminist theory and activist calls to map the racialized and gendered, racialized and sexualized bodies as tied to land, ecology, and control of territory. In attempting to understand how processes of racialization and sexualization affect Central American trans women in Mexico, I return to Julieta. It is significant that Julieta's first encounter with the Mara 18 upon arrival to Tijuana occurred in the middle, middle and upper class beach neighborhood of, of Playas de Tijuana. From my own observations, migrant resettlement uh, to Tijuana has been organized along racial, linguistic, gendered, and sexual lines. Absent of municipal and national funding, Tijuana's ecology of migrant shelters, hostels, and settlements have been organized primarily through religious institutions, especially the Catholic Charities. And here's this isn't an exhaustive list, um, but um, uh, there are many more shelters that are not for security reasons public. And this is not a public list, um, might I add, um, but this is just to give you a, a sense of, of of the amount of uh, religious institutions running these shelters. Most of these semi-permanent encampments are indefinitely located in the most impoverished inland communities, often within large informal settlements controlled by organized crime uh, that are entangled in local and national police and military power. Given the fact Mexico, Mexican and US-based immigrant and LGBTQ plus activists and donors have funded queer and transgender specific migrant shelters and housing programs in Tijuana. So these, these uh, transgender and queer specific housing programs would not be um, listed on that list for safety reasons. Yet these LGBTQ plus housing ratings are often located in middle class and even affluent areas. And, and they have met, have met uh, with hostility from local wealthy homeowners. The LGBTQ plus hostels were where um, Julieta was staying in Playas de Tijuana was forced to move by local Tijuanenses, Tijuanense elites, for example. In fact, the targeting of organized crime of these queer and transgender migrant spaces, uh, for example, Julieta's attempted armed kidnapping at the local pharmacy in, in Playas, contribute to a growing anti-immigrant migrant shelter backlash by local NIMBY homeowners. I have written about how Central American migrant victims are often associated in media and by, by in media and by policymakers narratives with organized crime and gang violence within a context of what Shannon Speed has called neoliberal multicriminalism in Latin America. The Altamira where the Altamira neighborhood where housing was arranged for Julieta and her partner, after being pushed out of, out of Playas, lies on the hilltop working class neighborhood that overlooks the urban center a few miles inland from the beaches. This hill is surrounded by informal housing and infrastructure wedged within the canyons that are scattered throughout the region. Competition among various street gangs for control of these neighborhoods, such as the Altamira, often spill over into gun violence. Incentives for controlling of territory in Tijuana for organized crime is highly lucrative, is a highly lucrative risk that involves access to drug trafficking routes and less protected subjects of, of extortion and sex trafficking, including migrants. Organized crime and others are aware of the embodied and spatial liminality of gender non-binary trans women, particularly Central American and Black migrant lives um, who are on the streets of Tijuana and the neighborhoods. Central American trans women's mobility and safety hinges upon competition and cooperation among local police, wealthy homeowners, gangs, and I would argue customs and border patrol. And this is a very sort of nefarious competition and cooperation among these, these elements. Given the way Tijuana's greater urban region has already 
uh, is already confined by international borders to the north, if you look on the map, the Pacific Ocean to the west and the arid desert to the east and the south movement is limited. Julieta, as a trans woman aside from the global south, living in, the, in, in, in Mexico's northern border cities, lives, uh, lives spatial experiences that must be always understood as racialized and gendered. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so we have some time. Um, this session was scheduled to run till about 5.30. So we have a good amount of time for questions. Um, I do have one question already um, from the audience. Um, and so if you have others, audience members, um, go ahead and start typing them. And um, maybe we will start with the um, first question. Uh, which came in from Alberto. Everybody can also see this, but um, uh, which I think is directed to uh, Etna, but others probably have thoughts on this too about the relationship between um, police and traffic enforcement um, and ICE in sanctuary cities. So, should I say something about that? Yeah, that'd be great. It's like we all have to learn typing while we're also talking, right? Um, so, <laughs> thank you for that great question. I appreciate that. Um, it's also a complicated question, and I've spent a while reading about that um, because sanctuary city has no particular meaning. Uh, what it means in practical terms is extremely varied. Um, some, a couple of things I might just say and others should jump in. One is um, there are studies that show that if municipalities agree to not cooperate with the police, the number of folks who end up in detention and deportation as a result of a traffic stop is lower. So these do make a difference, right? They are worth advocating for, but they don't fix the larger problem. But nonetheless, that's fewer people being deported. Um, Naomi Pike has a really wonderful piece that I'm sure many people have seen, and I know like Jenna's work on abolition, so I'm always guided by the work that she does. But Naomi Pike's piece points out that lots of sanctuary policies are grounded in logics of like safety and the police keep us safe and normalizing approaches that in fact, in the end, serve the criminalization systems that we have. Um, and she thinks about how could we have sanctuary policies that actually serve abolition and that seek to end both border walls and the criminalization of folks, especially black, brown, poor, queer people as a systemic practice in the United States. Um, Fiona Jeffries and Eleanor Ridgely have a nice piece that really walks through how could you turn this into action in your own city? What's it going to take to have not just sanctuary policies, but policies that serve the cause of abolition rather than maybe uh, letting people loop back in to promote stuff that really is still part of the problem? Those would be some of the things I would say. I mean, I a couple quick other things is it really varies. I live in Arizona, so um, at the level of law, so there's at the level of law for Arizona, our look, I live in Tucson. The police say they always have to follow SB 1070. Activists always say, well, there's space within that for interpretation. Um, so what it means on the ground really varies a lot by where you're at. And I look, for example, at California or at New York that has made driver's licenses available to everybody regardless. And the Trump administration's response was absolutely fascinating, which is it tried to make citizens be angry at migrants by punish by by disabling citizens travel, those who were part of global entry um, found that they could no longer use it as long as the state went along with driver license for everybody. So um, there's the politics of pitting different groups against each other. So very context specific and lots going on. I'll leave it at that. We did um, um... Dario or um, Sunny Bell, did you have anything to weigh on in on the, that question? One thing I might add 
um, with some of the work coming out, I guess a couple of years ago, out of Chicago, um, of organizations, Movement for Black Lives, um, together with migrant justice organizing, talking about expanded sanctuary, um, and so very much questioning that relationship of, um, of the ways in which policing, whether or not sanctuary in terms of migration consequences of policing was going deep enough in questioning policing within cities altogether. Um, and so I think that they did um, some really great work there a couple of years, three years. I've lost track of time now, back. Um, so um, one of the questions um, as our audience members formulate their own questions, one of the observations maybe I should make about um, all of your work together um, had to do with um, the strength, I think, across all of your work of like the strong attention to um, everyday experience, um, lived experience and affect. And um, then that is also to say um, a commitment to both historicizing and making geographically specific um, that lived experience. And so not having LGBT or queer or um, lesbian stand in as any, have any one meaning, but finding that meaning through um, the people whom you have been working with. Um, so that's one thing that very much stood out to me. Um, and, and I wonder if you might comment on that as, um, as one of the um, sort of approaches or emerging from the theoretical insights from um, women and gender studies, from, from feminist studies, from queer um, theory itself, um, as informing that across your different disciplines. whoever would like to try and make sense of that kind of question. So I, I can say, I can start. Um, so um, I think, you know, what, from what I was trying to do in my talk and also just some of the insights from queer feminist theory is this, you know, idea that um, the ways in which, you know, uh, queer gender non-binary uh, bodies experience their bodies varies, you know, um, depending on their their location, um, their, their, you know, in place and time, but also in sort of in terms of a, a particular local hier hierarchy. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, you know, it's particularly when thinking to when thinking about you know these uh, queer and gender non-binary bodies access to institutions, access to um, uh, protection, access to uh, mobility um, for for everyday uh, for to, in order to live their everyday life, um, and also to to love and, and you know to to share life with with someone else. Um, to, to belong, um, as Sandoval um, eloquently uh, described, and uh, these are inherently political um, for you know many uh, queer and gender non-binary bodies, um, and also racialized bodies as well. And so, um, but at the same time, these experiences are not sort of monolithic and not universal, but they're they they happen at a particular time and place. Um, so that is to say that, uh, for example, in, in the case of Julieta, the experiences of, of a Honduran trans, trans woman would be different than uh, in Tijuana than, um, than a you know, trans woman, a Mexican trans woman in Tijuana, Mexico, for example. Um, although they share the same sort of, uh, might share the same sort of identification as trans women, um, there are obvious differences um, in terms of experiencing um, uh, an, an effectively enriched life, uh, ability to have lo uh, love, 
and the ability to love, the ability to move, uh, to go to the grocery store, to go to the pharmacy. Um, and so, um, and it's, and that, that, that it's not only that they themselves are aware of these sort of hierarchies, um, but that um, other, other institutional actors are aware of this as well, including police, law enforcement, organized crime, um, and, uh, you know, local homeowners, um, you know, local business owners, et cetera, um, are aware of these, how these hierarchies sort of um, alter um, these local power relations. Um, and, and for me, um, I, my work is heavily influenced by women of color feminism, uh, feminisms and uh, queer of color critique. And so I see in these quotidian um, experiences, um, you know, quotidian forms of, of, of resistance, um, I see a lot of, you know, it, examples of, of survival and not not merely staying alive, but survival in the way that Audre Lorde articulated back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, maybe the way that people now say survival and sur surviving and thriving. Um, you know, Audre Lorde talked about survival in such powerful ways. And so looking at these quotidian um, example, quotidian um, experiences of uh, queer uh, migrants gives me a glimpse I think gives us a glimpse of, of, of that survival of, 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 of that survival as resistance of livability of uh, refusal um, refusal to, to conform and refusal to um, to to be dehumanized completely by these institutions even as they are as they are directly impacted by institutions and systems of power, they still refuse to give up that um, their, 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 their power. Um, and it also, you know, women of color feminism and, and queer of color critique also um, allow me to think about hope. And I was thinking about that as I was listening uh, to Edna talk about, you know, um, activists who, you know, like undocumented and unafraid, and I don't think I don't think you used the term hope, but I was I was I was actually wondering if if there was a reason why you didn't use the, the word hope because I kept thinking this is um, this is beautiful, this is amazing, uh, you know, the the kind of resistance that that folks are creating and, and like imagining and creating different presents and imagining different futures, and it's I think it's it's such a hopeful thing to to do and to think about, especially right now with everything that is happening. Mm -hmm. um, I guess your question is, thank you, Sandoval, and maybe I'll talk to you because there's so much, but I don't want to take up all this time. Um, your, your question as well, Jenna, was huge, so maybe just a couple uh, quick comments. I'm always working in that complicated space, and I think everybody is saying that that, you know, on one hand, these terms have baggage, and we have to work with the baggage. But you can't just abandon the terms because they also do important kinds of work. So in my work, I'm always trying to differentiate between um, what people claim for themselves and what they mean by it, which is really critical, versus, for example, you look at the LGBT pod by the government to detain migrants, which is now a trans pod, and the government's definition of those terms and what they mean and what the definition does is really, really different, right? So I'm always trying to track the politics of who's using the categories and for what. And Sandebel, like your presentation, also really got at that question of those words themselves are points of conflict within communities and sites of assertions of power that have to always be negotiated um, and I would agree like you know my training is ethnic studies Berkeley and that's my toolkit like queer of color women of color theory is where I start and thank you and I, I think um, like your comments also um, made me think about how then that the methods that you're using um, provide a different way of, all three of you, a, diff a different way of looking at the state 
um, and its institutions, and also, I think importantly, like the um, the limitations of what those policies do do um, through the various ways in which people um, both navigate and also create forms of community and resistance. So I would sort of like add add to everything that you said. Um, so I see um, that there was a hand up. Um, so Am, can we take a person asking a question um, with their hand up, Consuelo? I'm not sure how that would work or if it would be better to do questions in the chat. I don't know. You could weigh in on that, Am. Um, if anybody would like to ask questions, please put it in the chat so that we okay. can all see it. Okay. So, um, if uh, Consuelo, you could um, add your question to the chat. I will go to Tiffany's question, which is directed to Dario um, about um, um, experience of uh, migrants in, in Tijuana. Do you have okay, access to that uh, question? Yes. It, okay. Um, and so, uh, if if I'm reading the question correctly, the question is about um, information or statistics as um, regarding individual camps um, or hostels and whether or not they are um, at capacity. Um, apologies to the slow response. Yes. Um, so um, this is a very difficult. Um, question to answer. Um, there are no statistics um, regarding individual hostels um, in Tijuana um, or uh, along the border in any city that I'm aware of. Uh, Tijuana ha probably has the most developed ecology of migrant shelters and hostels out of all the border cities. Um, and um, this is um, this is in the face of the reality that um, it is not um, the the mo the the with the most um, asylum seekers waiting to to enter the U.S. Um, uh, actually, uh, Ciudad Juarez has a larger percentage of migrants. If you if if you remember back to the map I showed you, the L.A. Times map, um, and they have even less um, infrastructure uh, there in um, in Ciudad Juarez to address the needs of migrants. Um, and asylum seekers uh, stranded stranded at the U.S. border. So Tijuana is actually um, better organized than other border cities, and yet most shelters are at capacity. Um, to, to find out or to be sure of, you know, you have to call an, indiv an individual shelter and talk to the, oftentimes the priest, um, who will interview an individual, um, uh, an individual who's interested in staying at that shelter, and um, they will be placed in a shelter depend uh, uh, the, based on their gender, uh, based on their family structure, whether they're whether they're with minors, whether they uh, have a spouse, um, and then also, um, as I talked about, uh, based on their sexual orientation, um, they may not, you know, uh, trans, queer, and trans migrants may not feel welcomed or comfortable at these religious-based shelters, and so. Are alternative shelters set up by U.S.-based and um, local Mexican um, LGBTQ and activists, um, and uh, those shelters are completely privately run and, and donated through private funds. And so, um, and that information is not public for safety reasons. Um, as I mentioned, although um, these divisions um, within this ecology of migrant shelters and hostels in Tijuana. Um, reinforce, um, I think, and even naturalize, perhaps, um, uh, racial and, 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 and sexual divisions um, within this diverse population of, of displaced migrants in Tijuana that include African migrants, black mi migrants, Haitian Creole migrants, who, who also have their own sort of shelters. Um, Little Haiti is probably the most well-known of these shelters, um, and Little Haiti, um, uh, despite the misnomer, also houses um, Central American migrants. Um, but it, uh, it is home to the vast majority of, of Haitian Creole speaking migrants in Tijuana. And it is located within one of these um, informal settlements in a canyon um, between the beach communities and the, the urban center. Thank you. 
Um, so Consuelo has a question about um, how hard it is to promote this research in traditional departments. Um, so uh, this goes to, well, the question of the academy and the research that we, that we, uh, we do. Lots of ways to answer this question, I'm sure. Anybody like to, to take a first, first go at things? Uh, one, one potential, um, I mean, one thing is that across, so you're in formally trained, each of you are formally trained in different disciplines and then are also drawing on some related scholarship out of some interdisciplinary disciplines um, too. So that complicates matters. Um, and then we're in conversation in um, an area studies conference, um, which itself draws on different disciplines. I find that an absolutely huge question that I'm struggling to say anything useful about, so I appreciate it, but um, I feel like we could all write 10 books about that because it really cuts to the heart of a lot of problems. So thank you, and I'm so sorry I can't say something helpful about it. Um, one thing I was excited about was that, Dario, so your most recent piece came out in Journal of Latin American Geography, right? And I'm a geographer by training, so I was like, oh, this is very exciting. Your presentation was very uh, geography-facing, uh, uh, is the word, <laughs> geography-facing. Um, and so, you know, there are these conversations that are taking place, um, I think, as many scholars within the social sciences and humanities facing um, social humanities facing social scientists and humanities try and grapple with these huge questions around um, gender and sexuality the state migration people on the move and all of these categories um, that sometimes the state employs to keep people from moving and um, living their lives um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but so there, some of these conversations do occur within, uh, within uh, uh, disciplines, but they, um, to me, are so often taking place in interdisciplinary settings. So Etna and I have met in um, American Studies Association, for example. Um, Gender and Women's Studies itself has people coming, as you can say more about from your positions, um, from different disciplines too. So I wonder if there's something to the interdisciplinarity also that is both um, a benefit, but it comes with its own challenges too. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, I think, you know, just talking about borders, <laughs> Our discussion of borders, our discussion of policing borders, uh, um, you know, can also be applied to the academy in terms of uh, disciplinary boundaries. Um, I know anthropology is a lot more, you know, liberal when it comes to um, interdisciplinary boundaries and, and geography as well, which is why I tend to draw from those two fields. Um, you know, anytime you're marrying, you know, queer theory, feminist theory, you know, potentially from the global south, which is what what I what I like to do, and particularly indigenous and feminist Latin American theory, um, with within that, you know, those uh, sub disciplines or fields, I guess, um, you know, uh, it, it kind of um, it, it it could be difficult for people to you know try to uh, disentangle the, the the sort of web of interrelations. Um, but I think that's one way to do justice to the complexity of the lives of the people that we are, you know, um, interacting with, and um, and also I think geography 
it provides us sort of um, an insight into the relationship between the body and, and territory and, and land and the use of land um, and the control of space um, that I think, you know, um, cuts across, you know, different fields and, and interests, particularly in migration studies. Um, and and uh, when we're talking about border enforcement or, or policing, um, you know, geography looms large, particularly feminist geography. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll say briefly that um, my, my training has been all in feminist studies, women's and gender studies, um, ethnic studies. And so these are disciplines that are, uh, these are fields that are very interdisciplinary and, um, you know, with, with intersectional approaches to, to all of these topics on migration um, borders. And, and I know that um, in, in, in some more traditional departments, there has been there has been i i guess gender studies and ethnic studies have have been suspect in some ways within um more traditional departments and and i um i would like to think that that is changing and that um yeah that that gender and sexuality and race and migration and uh, prison abolition, that, that all of these things are being taken seriously um, by, yeah, by more traditional traditional departments, and I hope that that continues. We have just a couple of minutes. Um, did you have any, you um, as um, our great speakers, have any questions for each other um, uh, before we uh, close out or any questions from the moderators who have been uh, waiting for everybody else to ask their questions first. No. Um, Tiffany sends a note of thanks. Um, and other people are sending notes of thanks. So perhaps I will take um, take their cue um, and send my own thank yous ver visual or verbally, <laughs> verbally and visually <laughs> to you all. Um, thank you so much for um, helping us kick off um, this series of conversations about migration um, and um, and starting with uh, questions around gender and sexuality from the the very get-go. Um, so I hope to meet you in person at some point again, or at some point. And um, thank you so much. And thank you to the audience members for your um, attendance and questions. <laughs>